Book 8, The Last Day, Chapter 4, The 33rd Day of Planting, Part 1 of 2. Mari put on another cheerful face late in the morning of the 33rd as she hugged the seven Cadby grandchildren. Their Cadby grandparents were already on the trail, suspecting that they would be so slow that their sons and their families would catch up to them before they reached the ancient temple. Mari kissed and hugged the three babies, Maggie, Mary, and Pato Cadby, the four preschool-aged great-grandchildren, her twin granddaughters, Lori and Jory, and their husbands, and then the other twins, 17-year-olds Canthy and Newell Shin, who were going to help their sisters. Traveling with them were Shem and Kella's oldest daughter, Miki, and her husband, Clyde. Already, Miki was pale, holding up to her nose the bundle of herbs Salima had packed for her, trying to stave off her nausea. Kella winced at her daughter. Are you sure now's the best time for you to leave? Miki swayed slightly. The way I'm feeling, Mama, there's never going to be a good time. But we're going very slow, Lori assured her cousin. There'll be plenty of time for you to lean over the horse and vomit. Miki frowned. Thanks for that. Jory chuckled in sympathy. She just means that we understand how you're feeling. We'll keep a close eye on her, Aunt Kella. We have plenty of water for her, and as soon as we get to the site, she can lay down and not move again until the last day. Everyone's fragile smiles dissolved. That used to be a family joke, saying someone wasn't going to do something again until the last day. A moment too late, Jory realized the literalness of what she just said. Oh, oh, I, I didn't mean... But Shem pulled her into a forgiving hug. Thank you, Jory and Lori, for taking care of my daughter. I can already tell Newell's going to stay as far away from her as he can. Newell, holding onto a pack horse, was scowling at the thought of his cousin vomiting all the way up the trail. His sister, Kathy, didn't look too pleased about the idea either. Miki looked at her mother. Come with me now, Mama. Kala whimpered. Oh, Miki, I... Shem vigorously nodded his head. I'm trying to get her to go right now, even. Let's get you up there, Kala. Kala wrung her hands. Oh, but I can't yet. Shemmy, I need to be with you. But my Miki, oh, she's so pale. Isn't there a net sling available? Mari put a bracing arm around Kala, whose eyes now darted between her family. All of the net slings were being used by those more frail than Miki. Kala, there's never going to be a perfect solution, Mari told her. No matter what you do, you're going to be torn between going and staying. Bravely, Miki sat taller and made her mother's decision for her. Stay here and take care of Papa. There's nothing you can do for me on the trail but wipe my chin. Her husband, Clyde, who had been silent until then, stepped forward. He was so scrawny, the opposite of his burly father-in-law, that Mari frequently thought Shem could have snapped him like a twig. But Clyde was gentle and a genius in calculus, so Mari had always liked the young mathematics professor. She held her breath, hoping that the timid, mousy man would do something more than calculate how often his expecting wife would get sick. Wipe your chin, Miki. Isn't that my job? Mama Kella, he said to his mother-in-law. We'll be fine. We're surrounded by help, right? That's what the writings say. I can take care of your daughter for you. Kella sighed in resignation, and Shem glowered at his son-in-law. He was hoping to have more reasons to send his wife to the site now, not give her excuses to stay. Still, he put on a grateful smile. That's absolutely true, Clyde. Shem clapped him heavily on the shoulder. Oh, sorry, here, let me help you up. Mari caught the glances of Con and Sam Cadby. Both of them were built like bears. Con, a black bear, Sam, a grizzly. They responded to Mari's look with one of their own. Yes, Mugga, we will watch out for our little Clyde. There was no more time to waste. 
Kala took Shem's hand and smiled apologetically at Miki. She smiled back a little sadly, but was buoyed up by her husband's enthusiasm. Soon the next wave of descendants were on their way to the ancient site. Traveling with three babies, Mari sighed as the wagon and horses set off. Pedro put an arm around Lilla, who had been uncharacteristically quiet. As soon as you want to leave, you can. I'd feel better knowing you're up there with everyone. You can go with the large group leaving this afternoon. But Lilla firmed her chin. Not until I know, Pedro, she whispered. Mari, Shem, and Kala regarded each other sadly. Lilla was waiting for news of young Pear. She still hoped he might come wandering back to the house at any moment. He's traveling with them, Lilla, Shem assured her. That much we know. Lilla turned to the south. The men at the towers had taken down the mottled gray banners and up with the spotted gray banners this morning. The army was in the canyon, approaching Salem. Up with that banner had also gone the black with white sword banners in nearly every region of Salem, except for Region 3, where the Shins and their families lived. Theirs was the shortest route to the site, and to keep the flow of people from converging too quickly from the various routes, Pato and Shem staggered the times as to when people should leave. But they weren't about to deny anyone who wanted to go earlier. They still had at least two days before the army would enter Salem. Then the solid black banner would be raised, and any who remained in the valley would know it was now or never. Even the tower watchman, after hoisting the solid black, would leave immediately on horses tethered and waiting at each tower. Lilla was insisting on waiting until at least tomorrow. Today, she would continue to help those in the rectory needing assistance. Although, according to her detailed checklist, which every rector's wife kept to make sure that not one person in Salem was unaccounted for, everyone was prepared. Mari knew what her daughter-in-law was feeling. Hour by hour, the Shin, Brighter, and Zena's families were separating, never again to be all together in the big houses or in the orchards laughing and eating cake as they did just three days ago at Vidro's wedding. Life at the estates was slowly ebbing away. Mari sighed and put her arm around Lilla. She looked to the canyon entrance miles to the south. Nothing yet, and nothing expected today, but soon. Earlier that morning, Barnus Shin had met with Jaitsi, Deck, and the four oldest brighter sons to discuss moving their wives and their seven toddlers and babies. Of greatest concern was Erla's brighter, Holling's wife, who was expecting their second child in about eight weeks. She already was experiencing regular pains, and Salima, now fully trained as a midwife, suggested they all travel together. She and Lek had decided getting brighter away from Salem was probably the best solution to his recurring anxiety. And should the worst happen with Eraliz, she would be surrounded by help. Susie Brighter would go as the official babysitter. The rest of the families would leave tomorrow. The Zenuses and their four remaining children, plus Bosco's wife and two toddlers, the rest of the Brighters, Jaitsi and Deck and their five children, and the Shins, Pato and Lilla, and their last four children. Cephas Brighter would stay as Rector Shin's assistant, running messages from other rectors and checking the routes. Cephas exhausted three horses yesterday and showed no signs of stopping, and probably wouldn't until Pato would finally order him to the ancient site. Mari gazed at the houses, already so much quieter. Behind the orchards and gardens, the smaller houses there were abandoned, or would be soon. She could barely stand to look at them. She cleared her throat. Dishes to do, I'm sure. Going back in now. She left Pato, Lilla, Shem, and Kella in the road, watching their children leave. Mari's heart was near to breaking. All of Salem was dying. Its life and blood were leaking away. Slow deaths were the worst. She wandered into the kitchen and pumped water to clean up from breakfast. Her chin trembled as she saw the little cups and plates the grandchildren had used not long ago. 
that they would never use again. In some distant era, would there be a woman like her exploring the ruins of crumbling houses with vines growing over them and find these sweet little mugs and dishes? Would she have any idea how many people use them? and that they were all part of a large and boisterous family that laughed and argued and debated and hugged and cried. Would she realize the smaller dishes were for children? Mari's tears dropped into the basin. It seemed wrong to wipe away the little children's messes. She wanted to leave them there, to remember Anley pushing the pancakes and syrup around on the dish to make a swirly shape or Encio licking his plate so clean that Mugga wouldn't have to bother washing it. Already the water filling the basin was washing away the evidence that her great-grandchildren had been there. Already it was gone, too late to be preserved. Just last year she'd been so eager for the last day. All she could selfishly think about was the return of Perrin. Not once had she considered the fear confusion, and worry of her children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Now she wished she could do something to ease it. Maybe she had hoped for the last day too hard, and it was coming because she willed it. Perhaps it was all her fault that Eraliz was suffering from pains far too early. Should that baby be born too soon, die because of the coming of the last day, you didn't cause this. It was coming anyway, and you know it. You just now feel the pain everyone else has. Look past the next few days, Mari. Remember, it will be glorious eventually. Mari sniffed and smiled. Thank you, Father. I just feel guilty for my previous joy. Why should you feel guilty about joy? You were right. It's just getting through these next few days that will be most difficult. And as horrible as they may seem, the day will come when they will be remembered only as a brief memory. The joy that follows will erase the heartache of the next few days. Mari began to tremble. And then I'll get to see you again, right, Father? I'm counting the seconds, Mari. She grinned. Just how many seconds, Father? Ah, too many for you to count, my darling daughter. Just wait and stay focused on the end. Will Brighter and Eraliz and Miki and everyone else be all right? They're all in the Creator's hands, Mari. No place could be safer. Mari picked up a little dish. They still need to grow up, won't they? Still need dishes. Trust the Creator to provide a most glorious ending, Mari. She was about to ask what that meant when she heard the chimes clanging. She told herself she wouldn't go out to the tower to see the updates, but she couldn't help herself. She set down the dish and rushed to the front windows. Messenger coming with news for guide Zenas. Mari looked to their house and saw that Shem and Kala, who had been walking home, now started to jog to meet the messenger. Pato at the front porch with Lilla, trotted down the stairs over to the Zenuses. But Lilla walked to the front door and plopped down on the sofa. Mari had never seen her look so discouraged. They'll be fine, Lilla. I've just received assurance that they are in the Creator's hands. Lilla smiled grimly. I know, Mari. I just hate sitting and waiting for the next thing. Let's not. She suddenly stood up. Let's go to the Zenuses and see what the next message is. Maybe Thorn fell down in a canyon and died or something. Mari snorted at Lilla's uncharacteristic wish of violence upon someone. Let's go. They set off arm in arm for the Zenuses. Halfway there, they saw the messenger racing to the house, and Lilla and Mari picked up their pace to get there before the most important news was revealed. As they approached the house, they could hear through the open window the messenger talking to Shem. Mari stopped and put her finger to her lips, signaling to Lilla that here was as good a place as any. Take advantage of the echoes in the valley. We could hear them plainly even a mile down the canyon. 
I remember the days when spying was a real challenge, Pedro remarked. But is he all right? Kella asked. Could they see in what condition he was in? The scout said he seemed to bounce as he hit the ground. Lilla gripped Mari's arm. Someone bouncing as he hit the ground? It had to be. Lilla released Mari's arm and bolted for the front door. She blew in like a tornado with a winded Mari behind her. Young Pear, Lilla cried. Was it Young Pear? Did you see him? Pedro gingerly took her shoulders. How long have you been listening in? Why didn't you tell me? Even Mari blinked at Lilla's volume. In his best calming voice, Pedro started. Shem didn't want to. Shem, tell me! Now Kella stepped over and took her youngest sister's shoulders. Lilla, they have seen young Pear. We didn't want to tell you because we didn't know how he's involved or what's happening. No, Lilla whispered, suddenly drained of enthusiasm. No, not my boy. He's not betraying us, is he? No, Mrs. Shin, the scout said with a hesitant smile. Not at all. That's why I'm here. Woodson wanted me to let you know that he spied him early this morning, leaving the valley and approaching the canyon. He is in the lead, but he's shackled, wrists and ankles. Mari covered her mouth with her hand. Oh, no. No, that's good, the scout insisted. That he's alive, that Thorn's still trying to use him. This is good news in a way. Lilla trembled. I don't understand. Lilla, Shem said gently. Last night, Thorne announced to the army that there was a reward for locating Drusus, Versa, and Delia. Oh no, Murray said again. But it gets worse. He also wants Eltana Jordan found. But how did he know about Eltana, Murray said. Who revealed that she and the Thorne women are here? Oh, she said, remembering. Anoki Kaya, he must have made it back. Possibly, or Amory Ryling, he reminded them. She knew about Eltana before she left. But it gets even worse, Shem said, sending a bracing glance to Mari. The reward for them is 100 pieces of gold. However, there's a 200 pieces of gold reward for Pato and Jaitsi each. Lilla's eyes grew large. What? Pato gave her a sappy smile. Seems we've been kept hostage here and Lemuel's coming to free us. Isn't that nice? Mari scoffed. Uff, he always knew you were alive. And now he's making up some ridiculous story about rescuing you? What does this have to do with young Pear? Lilla asked. Shem tried a different smile. This one almost genuine. Last night, he made a stand against Thorn. He climbed the tree that holds the observation ladder and started shouting to all the army that Thorn was lying, that Salem had no gold or wealth, and that he stopped his voice unsteady, that they were ushering in the last day by attacking Salem. Lilla looked at Pato, almost afraid to hope. His eyes were shiny. He's not completely lost. He remembers. And he believes, Shem choked out. Mari clapped her hands in joy but couldn't speak. Young Pear wasn't another one of Thorne's obedient little soldiers after all. He was a Shin, loud and obnoxious and trying to proclaim the truth to the world. Lilla's eyes were now glistening, her mouth hanging open as if words were supposed to come out, but none could find their way yet. Kala took her sister's arm. Then Lilla, he fell from the tree and bounced unconscious on the ground from what the spies could tell. The soldiers carried him into the stables. No, Lilla whimpered. Is he, is he? That's what I'm here to tell you, the messenger said with eager exasperation. This morning he was walking out, shackled wrists and ankles. He's up and fine, and they're forcing him to find the way to Salem. But he's not willingly helping them. 
Finally, Lilla's tears flowed along with her words. So he's coming home, Pedro! He's coming home! The front door flew open again and there stood Jatesy, flushed from her run from her house. I could have heard that shout a mile away. Is it true, young pair? Calla smiled cautiously. Seems to be, but young pair's in chains and at the head of the army. Jatesy's mouth twisted at that news, unsure if she should be happy or sad about that. So that's good, really, the messenger gestured wildly. If you say so, Jatesy smiled. I'm glad you're here, Jates, Shem said soberly. We need to get you out this afternoon. Go with Salima and the rest. W why? Lemuel's coming to free us, Jates, Pato declared with fake cheer. We're being held captive, didn't you know? And the reward for finding us is 200 gold pieces for each of us. 200? Jatesy blinked in shock. That's a fortune. See my concern? Shem said, his voice growing tighter. I can't risk you staying here. You and Mari need to get out now. Mari glared at him mischievously. There's no reward out for me, Shem. But if someone found you alive, he rounded on her. Lemuel would give up the mansions in Idumea to get his hands on you. Mari stood taller. Sounds like I might be rather important then. So am I, Jatesy added with a wink. Shem threw up his hands. What is wrong with you women? Don't you get it? Each of the nearly 80,000, the messenger cleared his throat, <clears throat> guide, about 72,000, last estimate. Lost a few more last night, too. Still a lot, Shem bellowed. Each of those soldiers will be looking for you. And will Lemuel keep you alive? He'll want me alive, Jatesy said coolly. Mari felt a chill run down her spine. No, Jatesy. Shem grabbed Jatesy by the shoulders. In a low voice, he said, I stopped him once from getting to you. No, you didn't, Uncle Shem, Jatesy said. I stopped him, remember? He was already in bad shape by the time you got to him. You may have threatened his life, but I was the one who kept him from ruining mine. I handled him before. If I have to, I can handle him again. Pato and Mari exchanged looks of bewilderment. There was a story neither of them knew. Look, Shem, I'm not planning to bring him a loaf of bread when he invades Salem, but I'm also not leaving until I'm sure that all my children are safely on the route and that Mother, Lilla, and Pato are ready to go. Deck and I already decided that. Deck will change his mind when he hears that Lemuel is looking for you, Shem warned. I, and only I, will decide when I leave my home in Salem. There's still much to do. You need me here. Shem's chest heaved in frustration. Do you still have faith in me, Jatesy Shin Brighter? Complete, guide. But right now I think you're acting as my uncle. I will go when I feel the time is right. Don't you have faith in me, Uncle Shem? Shem sighed. Why I ever think I can make any headway with Shin women, I will never know. Mari beamed proudly at her daughter. Jatesy winked back. Just so you both know, Shem announced, I don't like this. Not one bit. Of course you don't, Mari said blithely and turned to the messenger. You said they lost some soldiers last night. What do you mean by lost? The messenger smiled. A lot have become ill, but about 3,000, maybe more now, are refusing to go on. It seems a certain voice kept them up all night and sufficiently scared them. John Afra! Mari clapped her hands. Everyone else chuckled. He recited Guide Hiram's prophecy about ten times before his voice gave out. The scout explained. He and Timon are napping in a camping shed we have tucked away in a hidden canyon. He plans to get back to work shortly, though. 
Shem smiled genuinely. He should be very proud of himself. He conquered 3,000 men and never raised a blade. Tell him that when he wakes up. Shin looked down at the slushy ground as he tried to pick his way through the rocks. He never noticed before how necessary being able to hold one's arms out was for balancing. Twice he had slipped and fallen and wasn't able to brace himself as he hit the ground because his wrists were too tightly bound. The second time it happened, Thorn sniggered behind him. He looked back to see Thorn's sneer and Healy's nod of sympathy. He struggled to his feet, Cloud Man rushing over to help him, and continued down the slippery, muddy canyon. Cloud Man kept a protective hand on his arm to keep him from falling after that. He seemed to be the escort of the morning, and Shin thought that at least one thing was going his way. But he began to grow nervous, because around the next bend would be the first split into two. He knew the pattern of which canyons to choose on the way down, his father had each of the children recite it when he took them up there. First choice was right, but Shin tried to think of a believable way to appear not to remember, and maybe even get Thorn to split the army, one part taking the endless canyon to the left. If he could get the army to split and get lost enough times, he might be the only one left to reach Salem. He evaluated the slope for signs that anyone would have left to warn Salem of their approach. The army could be there before midday meal, but there were no tracks. If someone had been spying on them, they may have found an alternative way back to Salem, probably along the tops of the peaks. Still worrying and plotting, he rounded the corner of the canyon well before the divide and stopped, astonished. He wanted to laugh but was too stunned to make a noise. Cloud Man stopped just as quickly behind him, with Sergeant Beavid and the rest of the security team bumping up against them as they came around the bend. What the slag is that? Beavid shouted. Shin was grinning. He couldn't help it, but it was brilliant. He knew he had to compose himself because Thorn and his group was coming up behind them. What's the hold up? Thorn demanded, as he saw the security team rooted to the ground. Why aren't you moving? Crete, how did that get there? Why, why, it's a wall, Healy said in amazement. Made out of what? Thorn shouted, as if staring at a personal insult. It must be at least 25 feet high. Who builds a wall in the middle of a canyon? Looks like block mused another officer. Shin walked up to it, struggling to conceal his smile, and ran his chained hands along the tall block wall that fully spanned the canyon about 30 feet across. I think it's made of ash, Shin guessed, peering at the particles. What? Thorn exclaimed. They turned the ash into blocks? Seems like it, sir. Shin could barely keep the admiration out of his voice. If Pugga were still alive, this would have been the kind of thing General Perrin Shin would come up with for slowing down the army of Idumea, a gray block wall. Cloudman stepped up to the wall and, without a moment's hesitation, licked it. Shin stared at him. The rest of the security team scowled. Yep, Cloudman nodded. Tastes just like ash. How would you know that? Beva demanded. Doesn't everyone? That's likely how he survived the volcano, Snarl muttered. He ate his way out of the ash. Cloudman shrugged sheepishly. I, I don't believe this, Thorn said, as if his proclamation would make it disappear. But it wasn't vanishing, despite him waving almost helplessly with his left arm at the massive blockade. We have to get around it or over it or tear it down or something. How do we do that, sir? asked an officer. I don't know. Build a ladder. Out of what, sir? came the almost timid reply. Thorn looked wildly around. 
All that grew in the canyon were scrubby trees, which could never hope to even be step stools. Tear it down, Thorn hollered. Already a couple of soldiers were inspecting the block and shaking their heads. Brittle and easy to knock down, right? The general asked. One of the soldiers, a man in his forties, was squinting at it worriedly. Sir, this is solid. I'm guessing each block is probably at least a foot wide, if not more. And the mortar holding it together? Well, this is excellent construction, he said in reluctant approval. I helped build your new armory at the garrison and sir. I wish we could have constructed it like this. He thumped his fist on the wall. Look, it's carved into the mountainside, anchored on every row. The block extends into the stone. I mean, this is quality work. Shin tried not to grin. This was a Salem job, which meant the wall was designed to last for a century. Thorne's fist was clenching and unclenching repeatedly. His builder ran his hand over the wall, nearly caressing it. Perhaps if we had sledgehammers, which I can't imagine anyone would have thought of bringing, I suppose we could send word back, have someone retrieve hammers and picks. Then we get to work and I think we could have a sizable hole within two or three days. Or if we bring up shovels, we might be able to dig under it. We climb the side of the canyon and over the wall, Thorne decided, already abandoning the tear it down or dig under it plans. Several of the soldiers let out low whistles. It's not that high, Thorne insisted. His builder shrugged in unwilling agreement that climbing was the faster alternative. No, it's not that high, Healy agreed. However, the sides are very muddy and steep. We'll have to make a chain of men to help get everyone over. This could slow us down a few hours. I don't care, Thorn raged. Start now. Shin, start scaling the side and get around this slagging thing. Shin held up his shackled hands. I'll go more quickly if I'm not chained. Sir, said Healy imploringly, at least take off his leg chains. No, Thorn was nearly frothing in anger. His little cloud friend will help him. I'm not unchaining you for anything, Shin. I rather enjoy watching you struggle. Now climb. While the task seemed impossible, Shin was happy to attempt it. He stared at the wall and nearly snickered in delight. Beautiful absolutely beautiful, and it would waste a lot of time. He looked for handholds or anything else to grip as he evaluated the muddy bank. How about this? Cloud Man squatted and webbed his hands together as a foothold. I can push you up to that bush there. He felt bad about putting his muddy boot on Cloud Man's hands, but realized that Cloudy might just lick them clean again. Shin scrambled as best as he could up the slippery slope, covering himself in mud before he finally reached the top. Heaving himself on top of the wall, he laid on it precariously and looked to the north and snorted. What is it, Private? Thorn bellowed. Walls. What? More walls, Shin called almost gleefully. The canyon splits about 40 paces from here, and there are walls closing off both sides. What in the world are Salemites thinking? Thorne exclaimed. Healy smiled vaguely. They're thinking that they don't want the world invading them, sir. We best think of a faster way over these walls because we may encounter a few more. Block! A woman's voice shrieked. Amory had just come around the bend joining hundreds of soldiers stacking up and staring in bewilderment. Since when does Salem make block? She pushed her way through the growing mass of stunned soldiers to where Shin was still lying on top of the wall. They made a few walls, he told her, cocking his head in the direction. They found a good use for the ash. He thumped his fist on it and beamed. This is, this is ridiculous! Amory exclaimed. 
were miles away from Salem. To construct this, they had to haul the block all this way and then build it. I can't imagine anyone working that hard, another soldier said. Shin smiled at the barriers before him. That's because you can't imagine anyone working hard at all, he mumbled to himself. With the way they cooperate, they probably erected these in just a few afternoons. His chest swelled with pride as he looked at what Salem had accomplished. They had found ways to keep themselves occupied, likely during the failed harvest season, and ensured that everyone in Salem would have enough time to make it out as the army approached. How many more walls there were, he couldn't imagine, but was eager to find out. His people did this. Salemites, surprising Thorn and the army of Idumea. Peaceful, non-assuming people reducing the world's general to tantrums, now screaming for ropes or anything else that could be used to scale the walls more quickly. Without making a single weapon or causing a single death, Salem was sinking the will of the army. While several soldiers were just as irate as Thorn, many men were sitting down in the cold mud, shaking their heads in amazement, fatigue, and disappointment. Shin chuckled. Bugga, do you see this? Oh, I see it, young pair. Pato is perfect, exactly how I imagined it could be. Brilliant work with the block, Shem. Of course Salem would find a use for the ash. I wish you two could see this. The looks on their faces, it's got to be the funniest thing I've ever witnessed. Well done, boys. Pato and Shem walked outside and looked to the canyon, after finally calming down Lilla, who was fairly dancing back to her house. I suspect they must be near the first wall by now, Pato said quietly. Shem smiled. I wish I could see their faces right now. Pato chuckled. I wish I knew what father thinks of it. Shem looked wistfully to the south. Mari was right. He is getting closer. I can almost feel him again, and I swear I can hear him laughing, like distant bells. He always thought it would be so funny for soldiers to run into Gray Block in the middle of nowhere. Pato smiled. I remember when he came up with that idea when we were first coming to Salem. You and Mother thought we had the strangest sense of humor, but it was a great idea. So, Shem, what does he think of the wall? Shem closed his eyes and pondered until he grinned. He thinks it's perfect, Pato, exactly as he imagined it could be. Brilliant work with the block. He wishes we could see the looks on their faces. He thinks it's the funniest thing he's ever seen. Well done, boys. Pato whispered to the canyon. Thanks, Father. Keep an eye on him, please. And son, be careful. Let your mother see you again. Shin was down the first wall and analyzing the next two in front of him when the canyon divided, both routes blocked entirely. He evaluated one, then the other, then the first one again. Cloud Man copied his movements as if he could see what Shin was seeing. Eventually his gaze drifted upward and he smiled at a big fluffy cloud. So, which way? Beavid asked, joining them. The rest of the security team followed, Teach having made the most noise getting up the wall, then getting down on the other side with a rapid splat. Shin shrugged. What did he say? Thorn asked, out of breath as he made his way over to them. A chain of soldiers had hoisted and heaved him over, doing all the work, yet still Thorn huffed, as if he'd labored on his own. He spat on the nearest wall. Stupidest thing I've ever seen. What slagging Zenus came up with this idea? Shin nearly laughed again. For once the general got it right. The slagging Zenus probably did come up with this idea. Which way, Shin? Thorn demanded. He shrugged again. The way I look at it, you'd want to block off the route that directly leads to where you don't want people to go. 
but both routes are blocked. So maybe both lead to Salem, he suggested benignly. Amory, Thorne called. Do both routes lead to Salem? Amory, slipping down the muddy side, nearly tripped as she hurried over to them. I, I don't think so, but I'm not sure. I never really paid much attention when they were teaching about the canyons in school. Figures, Thorne mumbled in disgust. Amory pushed back her disheveled hair, inadvertently adding a muddy streak, and glowered at him. So now what? Thorne demanded. Split the army, Shin offered. One group head to the left, the other to the right. And which way do you want to go? Whichever way you command, sir. He blinked innocently. Thorne clenched his fist. I'm growing weary of you, Shin. You want to earn your name back? You're going to have to do much better than that, son. Shin clenched his own fists. It was probably a good thing they were shackled. He never, ever wanted to hear that last word from the general again. He felt strength, courage greater than he'd ever experienced, coursing through him. It was as if power from Salem was drifting up the mountain to reinforce him. He felt the energy of General Shin, Pato Shin, Shem Zenas, Decat Brider, and every other brother, cousin, and relative flowing up to him, reclaiming him, wanting him to come home. He felt his mother more distinctly than he had in seasons, and he also felt his grandmother. Mari Shin was still alive, still wanting him to remember who he was. She was sending out tendrils of influence, as if she were still sitting in a pumpkin patch, hoping to snag him and drag him back. And he wanted to go. He didn't need the name of Lech Thorne. His cousin Lech Zenas would be confused by it anyway. He had a far greater legacy waiting for him. And after nearly two years, he was finally understanding the power of that heritage. He wanted to claim it, to beg its forgiveness for ever leaving it, and he wanted to honor it as bravely as Mari Shin would. He was young Perrin Shin, and he never wanted to be anyone else. Young Per turned to Thorne with new determination. I don't want your name. I can't imagine why anyone would. I'm not your son, no matter what you believe. You're growing weary of me. Every man here is weary of you. You want to find Salem? Then find it. He was prepared for the slap. He steeled himself to absorb Thorne's furious smack across his face, and he barely moved. He continued to glare at the general, who expected the private to fall to the ground or look down in shame. But instead, he stood tall. Thorne seemed taken aback by his brashness. Oh, yes, General, young Pear squinted with disdain. That makes me want to call you father. There's a reason I never would, Thorne. You're not my father. My name is young Pear and Shin, and Amory was right. They called me young Pear. That's because there was an old Pear not that long ago. Yes, he was my grandfather. But you were never my father, nor can you ever hope to earn the right. Hit me all you want, Thorn, but you can never change who I am or what you are. So choose the canyon yourself. From the corner of his eye, young Pear could see Healy beaming. But Thorn stood shocked, not used to such flagrant insubordination, and evidently didn't know how to proceed. The several dozen men now on their side of the wall glanced at each other anxiously, waiting for the general's response. He was taking an inordinate amount of time formulating one. Young Pear stood as tall as he could and felt another presence very distinctly on his right. General Perrin Shin was staring down Lemuel Thorne, too. Thorn wilted ever so slightly, as if he could feel the spirit of the general daring him to touch his grandson again. Young Pear almost smiled at the strength of the presence. He could even smell Pugga, earthy sweet. 
and wondered if Thorn could smell him too. Finally, Thorn whispered, in as sinister a voice as he could muster, I have one more thing to do with you, Shin. Then I will kill you myself. Nothing will give me greater pleasure. Your days are numbered. Make no mistake about that. Young Pear nodded once, not at all intimidated. Thorn was full of unmet promises. Just ask anyone he'd told he'd give a medal. He still owed Young Pear a few. So which canyon, Thorn? He said, his contempt obvious. Left or right? Right, Thorn said in a dead voice. You and fifty men scout it for half an hour, then return. He turned to another group of men and shouted at them to take the left one. Young Pear caught Healy's eye. Healy winked at him subtly, proudly, before turning to choose fifty men to follow the general's orders. Young Pear turned to assess which side of the canyon to climb because he had a home to get to. He felt someone right behind him. Private Shin, you're going to get yourself killed, Beavid hissed. I'm beginning to really like you, so why can't you leave well enough alone? Young Pear turned to the sergeant. That's the whole problem with the world, sergeant. Everyone leaves well enough alone. No one takes a stand. No one declares what's wrong or right. No one dares to make a noise for fear they may suddenly, what, not be liked anymore? Or worried that they might not be alive anymore, private? Beavid whispered. But young Pear was undaunted. I don't care what Thorn or anyone thinks of me. No, I take that back. I care what my family and my guide think of me. If I die, at least I will have died for saying the right things. And my name's Young Pear, not Private Shin. I recommend we head up the left side of this wall. If Hammer goes first, then Iron can shove Cheech up to him and they can drop him over the other side. Beavid gave him half a smile. You're not the lieutenant anymore, you know. You shouldn't be giving orders. I don't even want to be in the army anymore, Sergeant. And I'm not giving orders, just recommendations. Beavid nodded. Follow Young Pear's recommendations, he called. Cloudman grinned at Young Pear. Jatesy walked back to her house with a shadow. She didn't turn around as she opened her front door, but called, I know you're there, Mother, and I know what you want to ask me about. Come on in. Mari slipped into the house behind her daughter. The family had completed their discussion at the Zenus's home, but one thing sat heavily on Mari's mind, and she couldn't let it go, even though it happened almost 30 years ago. I realize it's none of my business now, Jates, Mari hedged as she followed her daughter into the kitchen. But what was Shem talking about concerning you and Lemuel Thorne? She whispered his name, in case any children were around to hear Jatesy turned to her mother. Her expression was stern, yet also surprisingly amused. True, it's no longer your business. When she saw her mother clench her teeth, she chuckled. But it will kill you to not know, and I don't want you to miss the last day, after all. Jatesy glanced around to make sure they were alone. Voices in the eating room suggested some children were looking for a snack and Jatesy cocked her head for her mother to follow her into the larder. They sat down on crates, their knees touching in the large closet, and shut the door. I'm trying to remember just how much you might know, Jatesy began. You know, Lemuel was interested in me, right? Mari nodded. Of course, after the dance in Idemia. Did you know he was courting me? At that, Mari hesitated. Actively? Jatesy bobbed her head. Father was having those nightmares. None of us were sleeping well. And Lemuel decided to start walking me home from school each day. Mari's eyes flared. Bringing you home to an empty house? Jatesy patted her mother's knee as if she were five. Remember, this was about 30 years ago now. No need to get angry. Yes, yes, go on. He never came into the house. 
I always abandoned him on the porch. All he ever did was bore me to tears with stories about horses and army life. He never asked me questions, and I never really did anything but nod. So you weren't attracted to him? Did you ever smell him, mother? Jaitsey's nose twitched in remembrance. He always smelled of purple, lilacs or lavender or something that a real man shouldn't smell of. Like an old lady, Mari smiled slyly. Exactly, Jaitsey giggled as if she were 15 again. He was so perfectly handsome and perfectly shaved and perfectly scented. Ick. Mari laughed in relief. Oh, so what happened? Well, after several weeks of that, I told him I wasn't ready for walking and talking and such. Maybe in a couple of years, but not yet. I was trying to go into the house when he pulled me back and kissed me. Mari flinched. Where? In the front garden. No, I mean, where on you? My mouth, Jaitsey grimaced. I ran into the house and I washed it off rather violently. Mari nodded in approval. Good girl, but Jates, an unwelcomed kiss isn't exactly life ruining. Jaitsey's lip pursing told her that wasn't the entire story. Oh no. What else did he do? Not quite a year later, Jaitsey began, holding her mother's anxious gaze. Before the remembrance ceremony that marked one year since the land tremor, I had gone to bring father his dinner. I greeted some enlisted boy on the stairs, and Thorne saw me. When Jaitsey paused, Mari said, And? Jaitsey repositioned herself. He confronted me as I was starting for home. He dragged me over to a feed barn and accused me of flirting. You would have been about 16 then, Mari said. That's what 16-year-old girls do. Jaitsey raised her eyebrows. Not if they are the future wife of Lemuel Thorne, or so he said. Mari scoffed. He then said it was obvious that I was ready for courting, and I guess he thought I was ready for even more, much more, Jaitsey added meaningfully. Her mother squinted. Just how much more? Jaitsey shifted on the wooden crate. Not able to stall any longer, she gave her mother a look. Mari's jaw dropped again. He, he was not successful, mother, Jaitsey quickly supplied when she saw her mother growing pale. Sagging in relief, Mari asked, Oh, so what did you do? Everything father taught me, Jaitsey declared proudly. I screamed, I ripped his shirt, I kicked, and oh, how perfectly I kicked. I got him twice. He went down, hard and retching. That's my girl, Mari cheered. And that was when Shem burst into the barn, Jaitsey continued. He told me later that he had a feeling something was wrong. While Thorne was moaning on the ground, I got myself out of there. Shem sat on Lemuel's chest, pulled out his long knife, and threatened Lemuel's life while holding the blade against his throat. I know this story, Mari suddenly exclaimed. At least this part. Judith told me years ago that Shem was tempted to kill Lemuel at one point, but she never told me the circumstances. And now I know why. This must have been it. Jaitsey nodded. Shem eventually let Lemuel go, then came and found me hiding behind the barn. I was more worried about Shem than anything. And he told me Lemuel shouldn't be bothering me anymore. Mari released a sigh. Oh, I had no idea. I'm so sorry, Jates. Why didn't you tell me? Jates, he laughed softly. Remember how later that year, after the attack on Moreland, we were all invited to state the Cush's mansion in Idumea for the dinner? And how Lemuel wanted to take me alone with him? 
Mari searched the past, but found it quickly. You and Decca became engaged about that time, right? And married the night of the dinner? Yes. Oh, I remember now. I was furious that Lemuel had the presumption that we would let our daughter travel with him alone. Exactly. At the time, I thought, so this is what an enraged mother bear looks like. That's right, Murray said, fuming at the memory. I was ready to beat him into the ground. I pictured you shredding him and sprinkling him over Idemia, Jatesy said thoughtfully. Mari calmed down enough to chuckle. Oh, I like that idea. So why did you never tell me what happened in that barn? Well, first, I didn't think your killing Lemuel Thorne would go over too well with his family. But mostly I saw how much progress father had made. He was almost back to his old self by that time. His nightmares were more under control, and you didn't have to sedate him as so much. And he was laughing again. Jatesy took a deep breath. I so miss hearing him laugh. Mari could only nod and wipe away a stray tear. Well, Jatesy continued, I was worried how both of you would react if you knew Lemuel attacked me in the barn. So... I made Shem promise not to tell, and he made sure that he and Lemuel had the same schedules so he could keep a close eye on him. But mother, I'm fairly confident he let father know. Even though I made him promise not to say a word, I'm sure Shem wiggled his face in some sort of strange manner to get the message across. He would, Murray agreed. After the offensive, when we were helping bandage up the wounded from Moreland, Jatesy went on, Father was hovering rather closely, and I always on the soldiers who claimed to need more help than they really did. She chuckled softly at the memory of the young men trying to catch her attention. At one point, Father came over to me asking if I was all right. I had just finished with Thorne a few minutes before. Tightening the bandage on his chest with so much zeal that he squirmed in pain. I told father that I was fine, and also that I was proud of what he'd accomplished in Moreland. Then he said something like, I was just hoping to be brave enough to fight my way out of the barn. Then he kissed me on the forehead and went off to yell at some soldier somewhere. We never said anything more of it. But I'm sure he knew. Mari sighed. Oh, and he never told me. That's because we were all scared of you, Mother, Jatesy said with mock sobriety. We still are. Mari slapped her arm good naturedly. But I'm a little concerned, Jates. Why is there such a reward for you now? Might it be that Lemuel is still. She bobbed her head back and forth. Jatesy waved that off. I think he's just trying to flush out the shins. It's the same amount as for Pato, after all. Besides, I can't imagine he still thinks of me. I gave him no reason to then, and certainly not now. Mari wrinkled her nose at that. I remember what Drusus Thorne said when she was over for dinner some moons ago. She took a long look at you and said, I see why Lemuel pined for you. He may have pined many years ago, Jatesy said dismissively, embarrassedly. Drusus hasn't seen him for over 15 years herself. He's given up on the thought of me, I'm sure. He's had a dozen other women. Who didn't measure up to Jatesy's shin brighter, Mari pointed out. That may be what he's thinking, you know. We need to seriously consider... What if he still wants you? A booming voice on the other side of the door made them both jump. He can't have her. The larder door swung open and Jatesy and Mari, now practically sitting on top of each other in their surprise, stared at Deck. His normally tranquil light brown eyes were dark with anger. He's looking for you? When were you going to tell me? Jatesy struggled to stand up in the crowded pantry and helped her mother find her feet. So did Shem? Yes, Shem told me. 
Mari rocked back. She'd never seen her son-in-law so livid. Neither had Jadesy, but she wasn't one to be easily intimidated. Deck, she said soothingly, as she pushed out of the larder, her hands on his chest. I'm not going to do anything stupid. I am going to leave with you and everyone else just as we agreed. And I don't want you to spend another moment worrying about any of this. What are you two women planning? He demanded. Nothing, Mari declared. We'll keep your wife far away from Lemuel Thorne. Did you, did you know, she searched for a tactful way to put it, about his efforts with Jaitsey? Deck nodded hotly. Mari threw her hands in the air. Uh, so once again, I'm the only one who doesn't know things. Why is that? Because, Deck said with a hint of a smile, you're the most dangerous woman in the world and we're all terrified of you. Told you, Jatesy said. Mari smacked Deck gently on the arm. Ow, ow, he cried melodramatically. See? But immediately he sobered again. Please leave, Mari. Both you and Jatesy, get out of here as soon as you can. We will, she assured him, when we're sure everyone's... Mari didn't get to finish her sentence. Her son-in-law suddenly embracing her, probably for the first time, crushed the rest of her words. Jatesy sniffled at her husband's unexpected affection. I cried when Perrin died, Deck choked out. Don't make me, don't you. Mari patted him on the back and squeezed him. Not planning on it, son, she said, meaning that last word wholeheartedly. I love you, and I'll be fine. So will Jatesy. Thank you, Dick. Now, go milk something before I start sobbing. Chuckling, he released her and turned to his wife. I never said this before, but I'm saying it now. Leave me as fast as possible. Never, she whispered back. Never. I was afraid of that. He darted out of the house before the women could see his emotion. Well, Mari sighed, I never. Deck marched straight for his cattle, aimlessly and pointlessly, to work out the idea which struck him like a pitchfork in the chest. While he couldn't remember the first time, he knew that that was the last time he'd ever hug his mother-in-law. Because Mari couldn't bear to watch Lilla rechecking the bags for those who would leave that afternoon, and because the day was beginning to smother her much like her dear son-in-law had, she convinced Pato that the storehouse needed her expertise, and without accepting a ride from anyone, she walked over there. Except someone tried to stop her. Halfway there, she saw the large black Clark come trotting down the road. She exhaled when she saw who was riding him, the only man who ever properly tried to court her. Oh, Henri, she murmured as he reined the horse to a stop and dismounted. Mari, just hear me out. And who have you been talking to? She interrupted because she was never very good at hearing people out. He slapped his hands quietly, guiltily together. There was no cheerful dimples in his cheeks today. No boyish smile on his 74-year-old face. Mari, we need to get you out of... Oh, not this again. Not you, too. And she turned for the storehouse. Hey, hey, he called after her. He ran over and grabbed her by the arm and spun her around. Mari was alarmed. Henri had never been rough with her, but having spent a few years in the world as a scout had taught him worldly ways. Look, this isn't some game, Mari. This is serious. Lemuel is on his way right now. Yes, the walls are slowing them up, but I'm getting reports from my grandson who's in the core. They'll be here soon. And if Lemuel knows you're here, I don't care about Lemuel. You need to leave now. That's what Perrin would say, Henri exclaimed, his grip on her arm growing tighter. And I'll take you up there for him. Wait a minute, 
Henri didn't own a black Clark. He always got the gray Clarks. Someone had told him about her plan with Perrin to ride to the ancient site on a black Clark together. Stupid meddling shem. Right now, Henri said, his voice a bit calmer, now that he noticed a few passing Salemites were eyeing them both worriedly. Still, he didn't release his hold on her. I'm not doing this because I once wanted to propose to you. I'm doing this because Perrin was like a brother to me, and his wife needs to be rescued and taken far away so that she is safe for him. He was right. All the words sounded correct. Everyone was right that she needed to get out of Salem. But the idea didn't sit well in her heart for some strange reason. It just wasn't the right time yet. She gazed into Henri's eyes, and his blue eyes pleaded back with her. Almost, she agreed. Almost, she thought. No, she said quietly. She cleared her throat. <clears throat> no, I hear you. I thank you. Perrin thanks you, especially for stealing someone's black Clark, but no. He was so startled that his grip on her arm loosened enough for her to escape. Immediately, she started again for the storehouse. Mari, he called after her again. But why? She turned around. I honestly don't know, Henri. I don't. Please don't ask me anymore. But if I need you, I promise I will send for you. He took an eager step toward her. You mean it. You'll let me take you up. She sighed. Uh, sure, of course. You taking me makes the most sense. My family won't be burdened by me then. You and me. You've got the right color horse, obviously. Henri smiled hesitantly, not quite believing her. I've got your word now. Of course you do. Now head home and I'll let you know when I'm ready to go. Tell Shem, too, so he'll quit fretting. At that, Henri smiled broader, showing his dimples that made Mari slightly wobbly in the knees. He mounted his massive clerk easily and pointed at her. Day or night, he said. Call for me, day or night. Day or night, she repeated. Henri was about to kick Clark to leave, but first gave Mari one long, last searching look. She gazed back at him, adoringly, appreciatively. She had tutored him in her lying courses before he became a rector scout in the world. They both knew when words were only words without meaning behind them. Henri's shoulders sagged, but Mari lifted her chin and beamed at him. Without another word, he gently kicked his horse and was on his way. Mari rubbed her forehead and continued to the storehouse. It wasn't as busy as she expected, to her disappointment and relief. However, there was a steady stream of Salemites requesting items, and the rector in charge told the volunteers to hand out everything. There was no need to hold back anything for a rainy day. It was pouring outside. Besides, this way there'd be less for the army to loot. Mari retrieved saddles, tents, boots, and hatchets. Lots of hatchets, and knives, and bows and arrows, and pitchforks. But she didn't say anything about it. Most people didn't say much either, she noticed. Normally a place of cheerful conversations, the storehouse today was subdued, and discussions were brief. Any smiles exchanged were unnatural and worried. And when someone said goodbye, it seemed to be a final farewell. Still, Mari tried to keep on a brave face and offer a few genuine smiles. At one point, she came out of the back storage room, her arms filled with beige changing cloths to give to a new grandmother, and noticed a familiar face in the crowd of 20 Salemites waiting for their goods. It was Assistant Chorik, and he was watching for her. Chorik was next in line to be guide, having been called by Guide Gleese right after Shem. Had they been in the world, Mari had occasionally thought, that would have meant that the older, slight man with thinning black hair, skin tinted yellow like sulfur, 
and dark, narrow eyes would have been plotting Zenas's death to hasten his rise to the top. Instead, he was Shem's right hand in running the affairs of Salem. While Peta was in charge of securing Salem from Idumea, Assistant Chorik oversaw the interactions within Salem and delegated them to other assistants. Mari eyed him suspiciously as he flashed his ever-ready smile, which crinkled his eyes into mere slits. But Mari knew him well enough to notice there was no usual spark in his eyes. Something was up. Mrs. Shin, glad I found you here, he said, gently pushing himself to the front of the line. Guide Zenas. Oh, what does he want now? She snapped. On any other day, those waiting in line likely would have snorted a few laughs. But today, Salemites looked aghast at her disrespect. Mari bit her lip. I'm sorry. It's just that every time I turn around, he's got some other excuse as to why I should already be heading to the site. A man nodded to her. I was just wondering myself why you haven't, Professor Shin. What, and miss all of this? She said, placing the armful of changing cloths into the grandmother's large bag. This is where the action is. If your grandbabies need more, we have plenty, she said to the woman. I can't imagine anything worse than facing the last day with the baby in soiled cloths. Next, Chorik stepped in front of Mari his smile already gone. He said you'd be resistant, but to assure you this is not a plot to get you up to the site. We're hoping, he lowered his voice to a whisper, that the wife of one general might be able to talk some sense into those following the wife of another general. Eltana, she breathed. What's she doing? Chorik glanced around to see far too many curious eyes. Come with me, please. Mari followed him out to his wagon. He helped her in and slapped the horses before he said anything else. Sorry about that, he said. A few people in there may have been there on Mrs. Jordan's bidding. How many hatchets, knives, and pitchforks have been requested today? Quite a few, actually, along with bows and arrows. Why? Weapons, he said dully. Mari closed her eyes. Oh, how senseless. Tell me what's happening. Since early this morning, when they all gathered, Mrs. Jordan's been showing her new army different ways to incapacitate someone. She's telling them not to bother with killing, but just with maiming. Since they're outnumbered, they should focus on slowing down the army, letting them bleed to death. How gruesome! How does she know such things? I never asked Perrin the details of what they taught. She lived through a lot of skirmishes and battles, Chorik suggested. She probably witnessed a lot firsthand. Her graphic descriptions have so disturbed a few men that they left and went to guide Zenas, asking him how they could erase the images from their minds. But they can't! That's unfortunately true, Chorik agreed, but that's not what's so worrisome. Guide Zenas headed over there to find nearly 14,000 men had gathered to learn how to fight. She was more than stunned. <gasps> so many! We were a little surprised at the number as well. Supposedly two of the dissenter colonies have decided to stay put and fight it out. They're trying to make swords as quickly as they can. No, no, we're a place of peace. Not anymore, Chorik said dully. But I still haven't told you the worst part. It's not just the men that want to fight. Many have brought their wives and children. Mrs. Shin, there are over 20,000 Salemites massed on the eastern side of Salem. Many camping in the first wide canyon there, south of the river and the temple, trying to learn to fight. Mari covered her mouth because one-fifth of Salemites were delusional enough to think they were soldiers, and she was growing nauseated. Do they have any idea what battle is like? What a man's body looks like after it's been hit by a sword? I do. 
Perrin was badly injured twice, and I tended to dozens of wounded after Moreland. Even though it's been a few years, I'll never forget the horror of that blood. They obviously don't know, or they wouldn't be so gallant right now, said Chorik, his tone filled with frustration. It makes no sense. We've been teaching for years there's a solution. We've been preparing, but now so many have lost faith and hope. They haven't lost faith, Mari decided. They've just shifted it to themselves instead. They want to rely more on themselves than the Creator and trust in their own arms, not his. Oh, this is so ludicrous. Why? Why do they refuse his plan? Ah, Mrs. Shin, Chorik said. That's been the question ever since the first 500 families came to this sphere. Why would any of them refuse his plan? Why do they believe the refuser more than the creator? What does he offer that's better than the creator? Nothing. Only temporary flashes of entertainment or possessions. Then nothing. I don't get it. I just don't get it. Mari sighed as the wagon headed east. Oh, neither do I. Unless they simply can't believe what the Creator holds out to them later is better. Maybe they fear this is all there ever will be. They have no imagination to consider what may be in store later. So what does Shem think I can do over there? He's hoping you can convince some of those mothers to leave with their younger children. Maybe help them realize how gory this may become, how their children won't be spared. Oh, they won't, Mari wailed. Soldiers always go for the easiest kill. Oh, there'll probably be many soldiers who don't even want to fight at all. But those who do, slaughtering children and women will be no problem. I can't believe this is happening in Salem. Oh, Perrin, they might have listened to you. Chorik put his arm around her. But you've always been better with words, Mrs. Shin. If they won't listen to you, they won't listen to anyone. I'll be praying that the Creator can fill you with the correct words. Pray that I'll be listening for them, too. And that is the end of Part 1 of 2, Chapter 4, The 33rd Day of Planting. Did you keep all those numbers straight? Because if I don't have them written down, I can't remember where I am. Thank you.